ready for takeoff. Yeah, hello uh, everybody. I'm very, very excited to be here. So I'm starting my talk with this loading GIF intentionally because I didn't want people to get scared of the actual talk. And I'm going to talk about war, war in Ukraine. And before you think that, oh my God, war in Ukraine, not again, I want to make a couple of promises here. I promise not to share any violent pictures. I promise not to uh, talk about politics. I promise to make a couple of humble attempts in humor, and I promise to try my best to answer two questions of why and how. Why we should help here we attendees of Ruby Conference and how we can do it. But who am I to talk about it? I'm Olga Boyarentseva. I'm a full stack engineer at Cisco Miraki. I forgot to take off my mask. And <laughs> Shocking news, Cisco Miraki is still hiring. And I'm also Ukrainian. My family is in Ukraine. My cousin right now is in army. He's in, on front lines. My grandparents are actually in the city which is occupied by Russia. The majority of my family and friends are in capital in Kiev. They are without power, without heat, without water. But they're there and they're fighting. So why we should help? First of all, I believe that all of us here are Ukrainians. You either are Ukrainian or you have Ukrainian relatives or you have Ukrainian friends. If you don't have Ukrainian friends, come talk to me after the talk. I will be your Ukrainian friend. But also we should care about uh, this professionally. So shameless plug here to Viktor Shapilov, a very, very prominent uh, Ruby community member. And he was actually talking here at RubyConf in Nashville, 2019. Viktor right now is in Kharkiv. Just imagine, Kharkiv is a city in eastern part of Ukraine. It's been bombed and shelled every single day of this nine months. Like every single day, He's still committing to open source. He's contributor to Ruby language. So if you don't want to be friends with me, have a Ukrainian friend, think about this professionally. Here is Victor. And how we can help? Of course, the best way to help is donating money. And usually people divide between uh, those who donate always and those who are like my husband, and believe that it's all a scam. It never reaches like destination. And yes, the big international charities, only a little, little fraction of that money reaches the destination. So of course, the best way to donate money is find those local charities who work there in Ukraine. But it could be hard for Americans to do that. Yeah, you have to know Ukrainian language, you have to have friends, but now you have one friend. Yep. Uh, and so you can find those charities. But still, if it's hard to do that, uh, if uh, I would ask you to take just one picture of this talk, please take a picture of this one. This charity, Razom, Razom means together, together for Ukraine. Uh, this charity is, uh, was founded in United States. They are fully, fully transparent with their expenses and they are registered nonprofit. So if you donate to this charity, um, you can claim those money on your tax return. But also, I personally volunteered with this organization for many years. I know all members of the board of the organization. Not a single cent is spent on salary. Like everything you donate will go to Ukraine. But also now I want to mention another how, another how to help. I imagine here in this room there are a lot of professionals, a lot of managers. So I ask you, please hire Ukrainians. There are so many Ukrainians in the United States that came here for United for Ukraine program. Maybe you have offshore team and you're thinking about getting rid of that, yeah, Ukrainian team, because power outages. So let me tell you, those people are buying Starlinks to have 
power and Wi-Fi, yeah? So please don't fire, please hire Ukrainians. And I've been very good with my time. I have 10 seconds left. I wanted to say a huge thank you. I want you to remember me not as a yet another Ukrainian asking for money, but the one who said, without you, we could not be able to be fighting. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. My name is Jose Miguel Tomita Rodriguez. I go by Shami for short, and this is my talk, Baking is Like Programming. So a little bit about myself. I am a pastry chef turned um, developer slash aspiring career transitioner. And actually, the title of my program is uh, Vegan Gluten-Free Baking is Like Tutorial Hell, Lessons from the Entry Developer Trenches. So um, a little bit more context on myself. Um, I've always loved baking. Uh, I've been baking since I've been in middle school, and I've been professionally baking uh, vegan gluten-free pastries for the past three years now. And when it comes to software engineering, I've uh, grown to love it. Um, my first time coding was in high school, where I almost failed the class. Um, was reintroduced to it in undergrad coding for video games. And as of March of this year, I am a graduate of the Flatiron School Software Engineering Bootcamp. So let's go ahead and get into it. So um, for those of you who do not have to know what Tutorial Hell is, um, it is an early period in the developer life cycle where bootcamp graduates, self-taught coders, and any other poor, unfortunate soul um, jumps from tutorial to tutorial trying to level up their skills um, and hopes to become a self-reliant coder and get that first tech job. So unfortunately, this jumping around can easily turn into an endless cycle. Either the material doesn't stick or you get lost in the amount of um, code and skills needed to become a competitive uh, candidate. So uh, this inability to break out of that cycle uh, turns into a loop and into a hell of sorts. So this mucking around in the dark is actually very similar to the work I do at the bakery. So what's the deal with vegan gluten-free baking? So first of all, it's not a very well-documented science. There are a lot of online recipes, and we can call them tutorials for the focus of this talk. Um, but they leave a lot to be desired, and usually they're only really good, to, they're only really good as a jumping off point. So, um, and also considering um, that there are constraints of the bakery I work at, not only do we um, serve people who have celiac or vegan diets, but there's an emphasis on healthful eating, so everything is organic, minimally processed, which leads to a lot of varied, um, a lot of design constraints. So, uh, for example, um, these design constraints actually lead to an abundance of options for when it comes to uh, ingredient choice. So do you use almond flour? Do you use sorghum flour, millet, brown rice, oat flour? Um, what about the amount of fats? Like do you use uh, coconut oil, olive oil? Um, so what kind of mix of ingredients are you gonna choose that's gonna give you the results that you want in terms of flavor, presentation, and cost? And so let's take starches for example. There are a, quite a variety of starches that we use at um, the bakery, and they all basically do the same exact thing, but they all have their own nuances. So unless you go out and experiment, you really won't really know what they do. And so this type of uh, abundance of options is just kind of like the amount of uh, programming languages there are and also frameworks. So as an entry-level developer, you can be kind of like lost in the amount of a uh, tutorials and guides that there are online. So without a set guidebook for either, it becomes a protracted process to not only make single batches or one-off tutorial-based projects, but to develop good coding patterns and self-reliance to break from the tutorials and to code slash bake off book. As an entry-level developer, I don't have a hard and fast solution to finding salvation from this tutorial underworld, but I do have lessons from vegan and gluten-free baking that I think can be applied to at least turn your tutorial hell into a tutorial purgatory. <laughs> so how to break free. Um, so unfortunately, I think the most concrete uh, things that help are time, persistence, and continuous learning. Every time you make cinnamon rolls at work, for example, um, I learned something new that may become a best practice. So did you know that if you add more water than you think to gluten-free bread, you actually get a better rise because it becomes fluffier? Um, or how about that you can only get one rise out of gluten-free bread, which 
my hypothesis is that there is no gluten structure for it to like reinflate, so you only get one good rise. Um, and that's kind of like the way I learned Redux was just like going through it and learning it, um, sitting down and working through. And another lesson is to repurpose your mistakes, don't let them go to waste. Um, even if you're stuck on a project, um, comment it, at least it'll uh, be counted as a GitHub contribution, and lean into your support network. Um, I have had the uh, blessing of having a support network who's, that's helped me keep sane through the baking and coding process um, of friends, family, and mentors. And my classically trained um, pastry chef, Katie, with the cupcake, she would kill me if she knew I was using this photo of her. But um, she's learning alongside me um, vegan gluten-free baking, but with her expertise and my hands-on knowledge, we've been able to get through the pandemic scathed-free. And I've also had the opportunity to get to meet a lot of uh, really good engineers who've been able to motivate me and inspire me. And lastly, I've had a um, lovely family, um, my husband and my cat, who have been with me through the whole process, and without them, I wouldn't be here today. So I'd like to thank you for your time and connect with me if you'd like. Um, my name's Tom Brown. Uh, personal URL is here's tomwiththeweather.com, and uh, gl glad to be here. Um, we're sharing our uh, personal identifiers on, on Mastodon, like Alice at, uh, Alice at Mastodon.social. Um, but Mastodon.social is not a personal domain. Uh, Alice doesn't uh, own or control Mastodon.social. So what if she wants to use her personal domain? Um, what she can do, the cheapest, easiest thing, is um, she can add a uh, dot uh, well dash known slash webfinger file if she's using like a static uh, site generator like Jekyll. Um, and then um, what she can do is she can use Novu Mataki's uh, webfinger gem to, um, uh, if, oops, you know, gem install webfinger. And then she can uh, put her uh, Alice at mastodon.social to uh, webfinger and she will get a JSON uh, object back, and she can put that into her dot well slash known slash webfinger on Jekyll, uh, make sure to include that well-known directory, and then boom, she uh, can now be searched by alice at example.com. That's it, thank you. Uh, Barrett, I'm gonna need a little bit of help. If I could have your help up here, please. Thank you. Uh, I only have one minute, so I wanna address a, a glaring topic in the room. I have now spoken at RubyConf or RailsConf a handful of time, <coughs> excuse me, to address a uh, glaring issue in the community that I believe needs to be addressed today. Because I only have a minute, I'm gonna go through a handful of things. Uh, the first is, I believe that it is the best of intentions for everybody here to know how to give a stellar high five. So I'll be going over that today. Deep breath, but, deep breath. Thank you. But I know that right now is an interesting time for high fives. So I would like to advocate for alternatives to said high five, and Barrett will go over a few of those with me now. If you could please stand up and join me, I would like to teach you a few of these alternatives. Move quickly, I only have about four seconds. <laughs> the first I would like to go over is known as the jellyfish. It goes something like this. You extend for high five, stop and float away. <laughs> Remember, these are no contact. So Barrett and I will example, and then I would like you to practice. Ready? That is the jellyfish. The other one that you are probably very common to is the elbow. It goes something like this. Please. The last I would like to show you today is the foot bump. You're probably also familiar with this. Um, I know that the World Cup is currently happening. Please do not take your aggression out on each other for whether or not you have succeeded or not. But anyway, it goes something like this. Very good. Please demonstrate amongst yourselves. Now, if you feel as so comfortable to participate in the actual stellar high five, I will teach that to you now. <laughs> Step number one is this, friends, is you don't look at your hand, you look at their elbow. Look at their elbow and it will sound great every single time. Look at their elbow, look at their elbow. 
Congratulations, you have all given a stellar high five. All right, five minutes, let's do this. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Richard, and today I'm gonna to talk to you about open source, but before I do that, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about CPR. Uh, CPR is a life-saving technique that stands for cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Uh, is anyone here ever taken a CPR class? Wow, I feel very safe in this room. Good, good on you. So, um, you will, a lot of you will probably already know this, but one of the things that they train you to do in CPR is before starting chest compressions, you need to get someone to call 911. Specifically, you need to single out one person and get them to call 911. Why just one person? Why not everyone? If you don't single someone out, then everyone will think that someone else will take care of the problem. This is known as the bystander effect. The by <clears throat> and that is, whoop, that is too many clicks. Um, the bystander effect says that the more people that we perceive to know about a problem, the less likely we are to believe that it is our responsibility to fix that problem. And that is why when you start doing CPR, you don't yell out, someone call 911. You, you point out an individual, you get their attention, and tell them to do that. And by, by doing that, you are breaking the chain and breaking this bystander effect that makes action much, much more likely. So what does this have to do with software, you might be wondering. Uh, raise your hand if you have used software. <laughs> okay, good, keep it up, keep them up. Um, keep your hand up if you've ever encountered a bug in your software. Okay, I actually saw more hands go up, that's <laughs> awesome. Okay, keep your hand um, raised if you have filed an issue about that bug. All right, keep your hand raised still if you have submitted a pull request to fix that bug. All right, so uh, keep those hands up for just one second, I promise. This is not like an exercise uh, five minute power hour. Um, everyone look around. These are the people who saw a problem and chose to take an action. So uh, thank you very much for uh, your issues and submitted PRs. You can put your hands down. I wanna give everybody a round of applause who has contributed to open source. When people see a problem in software, they often assume that everyone knows about that problem, and that is the bystander effect in action. The good news is that there is an antidote. To overcome the bystander effect, you can choose to become an active bystander. The next time you notice a problem, tell yourself that if you do not take action, no one will. It's all about taking action. To, and so to contribute to open source, start by making an open source goal. When I started, I wanted to get a commit into Rails, which I've done, and I was super excited and told everybody about it nonstop. Um, and I want you to pick something that excites you. And then next, take an action that moves towards that goal. Focus on what you can do today. Now, a commit is pretty difficult. Could you start somewhere a little bit smaller? Maybe slice it a little bit thinner. Instead of fixing a bug with a commit, could you perhaps file an issue? If you can't do that, can you slice it thinner still? Can you look at someone else's issue and leave a helpful comment? Maybe you can, if, uh, if they have reported the bug, maybe you can reproduce their, follow their reproduction and confirm that you saw the bug. If you can't do that, slice it thinner still. Read another issue and look for someone else's helpful comment and give them a little heart emoji and be like, yeah, you know? It doesn't feel like much, but it's an action. You're getting out there, and um, that will help you build the habit of taking action and learning from others. So if you stay engaged, look for ways to help, and practice being an active bystander, then you'll set yourself up for success. If you want help getting started, um, contributing, I wrote codetriage.com. It will send you an issue in your inbox. I actually announced it 10 years ago at RubyConf. It was my grand opening, so pretty, 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 you know. A little coming of home, coming home, homecoming. Um, and with that issue in your inbox, you can read it, comment it, uh, heart it, or depending on your current action level, you know, maybe even fix it. So you can sign up today for free on codetriage.com. But even with the best software, it helps to have an instruction manual. Um, I released uh, How to Open Source. It's a book. Uh, this is in September, and this is for coders who want to become contributors. You can find it online um, at opensource.dev, uh, howtoopensource.dev. 
Uh, and for the rest of the conference, you can take $10 off with uh, the code RubyConf2022. Also, come talk to me later if you want to talk about open source or if you want a sticker. And everyone in this room has the capacity to change our community. You have the capacity to change the world. The important part is that you take an action, break out of the bystander's effect. Thank you. Is this okay? Can everybody hear me this way? Yeah. I, mean, I need this hand free, that's, that's why. And I wanted to hold my drink for those of you that are holding your drink, because this is gonna be a little bit of participation that I appreciate. Uh, my name is Bryce Simons. Uh, I know the very burning question you're all asking, is that his dog on his shirt? It is my dog, her name is Cora, she's three years old. She is not related to the talk, I just wanted her for good luck. Uh, I am a career changer as well. I attended Turing School of Software and Design, shout out to them, they're amazing. Uh, and I'm very fortunate to be part of the Scholars and Guides program, so I also want to shout out RubyConf for helping me attend today. I'm very thankful and grateful. Um, and so I was thinking about coming up with a lightning talk. I knew I wanted to do something. Uh, I have a tendency to talk a lot, and I might be talking a little fast because I have a lot to say. Uh, and so I was trying to think of what I wanted to come up with, and I was trying to think of do I want to do something technical, do I want to do something for my past, I decided to pick something for my past. I've done a lot of hiring, I've done a lot of training in regards to leadership. And so I thought I'd pick something quick and fun because I also like to have a lot of fun. Uh, and so I picked a game that I call Simon Says. Can I get a raise of hands? Who's played Simon Says before? Yeah, Simon Says. Who has played Simon you Says in the last two Says. years? Oh, wow, that's what I thought. <laughs> awesome, you can put your hands down. So I'm gonna go over the rules, just to make sure we're all on the same page. I don't want anyone saying, oh, Bryce cheated, right? So Simon Says, how we're gonna play. I'm gonna be Simon, you are gonna be the participants. I'm going to say Simon Says, and then we're gonna say an action. So for example, I'll show you. I would say something like, Simon says, put your hand on your head, right? And then you would all do it, great. And then I would say, Simon says, put your hand by your side. Ah, you're all so good at this, good job. Give yourself a pat on the back. Ah, I didn't say Simon says, ah, some of you got it though, some of you got it. Now, you already had me a little bit. So if I say, Simon says, put your hand on your head, right? You all do that. Now, if I say an action without saying Simon says first, right, we all know this, uh, and I say, put your hand by your side, and you do it you would be out, right? So we're following what I'm doing, what I'm saying, right? So Simon says, put your hand by your side. Great job. So I think, uh, can, can I engage? Are we ready? Yes. Oh, are we ready to play Simon Says? Are we ready? Yeah. Yeah, I want you so excited for Simon Says. All right, so the game of Simon Says starts now. I'm very clear. So Simon Says, and I'm holding my drink, by the way, for any of you that wanted to hold your drink at the same time, just to prove to you that I can do it. So Simon Says, stand up to the best of your ability. Thank you, thank you, I appreciate it. All right, Simon Says, put your hand on your head. We've done this one. Simon Says, put your hand on your shoulder. Either one. Simon Says, put your hand on your nose. Simon Says, put your hand on your ear. Simon Says, put your hand on your cheek. Ah, so some of you I saw, no cheating, put your finger on your forehead. So, Simon says we're gonna take a pause. Everybody take a seat. We're gonna take a seat. So, Bryce, that was silly. Why, why, why did we do that? So, so, so the game is paused for real. Simon says the game is paused. I uh, appreciate the skepticism. Ah, yes. So, Bryce, why do we do that? What I wanna bring up to you today is a, just a gentle reminder as we come into the holiday season into next year, maybe you're trying to think of ways that you can influence others. I just wanna give this reminder to all of you that your actions speak louder than your words, right? So some of you, you saw me, I went up here with my action. Bump. Anybody remember what I said, right? Your cheek, over here, right? So again, just a fun little reminder to remind you, if you're going into the workplace, maybe you're a manager, maybe you're, maybe you're managing a group, of, a group of people that you just want to see some change in, maybe you're saying things, potentially, I don't know, maybe you're saying things that are different than how you're leading, right? It's just a reminder, lead by action, lead by what you're doing. And this is outside of the workplace. Maybe you want to see a change in your own family, maybe you want to see a change in your relationship, a change anywhere. It starts with you, it starts with your actions. So please, I would just ask, keep that in mind moving forward. There's no harm in it. Um, my name is Bryce Simons. I am a Ruby developer looking for my first job. Thank you so much for listening to my talk. I greatly appreciate it. Cheers. Sweet. All right, hi. Uh, my name is Jacob Dario. I'm a junior Ruby on Rails developer who had the good fortune to break into the industry this past year. And this is my first Ruby conference, so thanks for welcoming me. 
So really quickly, I'm going to give a 500-foot view of models and multi-tenancy, and row-level multi-tenancy to be specific, at least according to Access Tenant. So disclaimer, I already mentioned, I'm a pretty junior developer. Um, I wanted to give this quick lightning talk just to show some of the other younger developers that some of these technical to uh, concepts, even though they seem intimidating and they have fancy names, are actually easier to understand than you might think. But if you're going to go implement this at work, probably check, uh, check my own work. So a bit of background. Um, I have a small toy application that I uh, developed for some of my friends who are still in college. Uh, and I wanted to do it multi-tenant. So I hopped on Twitter, as one does, and I started asking some of my friends from the internet, hey, wh what are the gems that people use for this? Uh, and Chris Oliver maintains Access Tenant. So I, I popped open the source and started digging into it. And I thought, oh, this is like 10 files. How hard can it be? So, you know. I don't pay myself to work on my uh, toy app, and I figured time doesn't matter. Might as well dig in and just see if I can learn something along the way. And I found that mostly it's just code added to the models. There's a, a few tie-in pieces, but really there's three pieces that go into getting your models tenant safe for row-level tenancy. Um, safety by default, validate your data, and there's a one big validation that really kind of goes into this. Uh, and lock down the accessors. And I'll quickly walk through uh, what all that looks like translated into plain Ruby with no metaprogramming. So first, safety by default. Um, for my application, my tenant is called an organization. So we have a nice little uh, association on there. Uh, and then we have two important validation, uh, two important like uh, guardrails. So first, we have a default scope, shock horror. Uh, I know a lot of people don't like to work with default scopes, but this is kind of one of the things that I'm glad I dig, uh, dug into the Access Tenant library for, because there's a default scope on all your models if you use Access Tenant. That's part of the library. And what this does is it ensures that you can't accidentally bleed tenant uh, records in between different tenant accounts. So if you have a current tenant set, in this case an organization, it will only query records that belong to that tenant. So Safe by default, right? You don't have to worry about forgetting that in your query. Uh, next, it also forces uh, setting a tenant on your models. So anytime you go and you run a create action on a model, it's going to automatically set that tenant ID. In this case, once again, an organization ID. Safe by default. We don't have things floating into the global scope. The next piece is <coughs> pardon me, validating those models. Um, is really one core validation. This looks a bit complicated, um, but it does the same thing over and over again. Uh, what it does is it uses, uh, uses reflect on association, and it checks all of our belong to associations on the model. And then it says, hey, if this is the organization or, or your tenant you know, belongs to, ignore. We don't need to check that. But if it's not, let's make sure that all of the records belong to the same uh, tenant. That way, we don't have a circumstance where, for instance, if you have a post and a comment, the post belongs to one tenant and the comment belongs to another. That would be bad because now you're bleeding records across different tenants. So this just implements this validation for each of your belongs to associations on your model. Uh, and finally, we lock down the accessors. So these two accessors, again, control the ability to set my organization or tenant. Um, and so it just overwrites them, right? So for the top one, we'll try to write to the uh, column. And then if the tenant was modified, which means it's going to save a change uh, and it's been persisted already, it won't let you do it and it will raise an error. Uh, similarly, if you try to go through the association path, in this case, organization assignment, uh, but whatever your tenant name is, uh, it'll do the same thing if it's detected that it's modified. And we just call it the super here. Um, and that's really it. That's all that, that there is in the uh, model extensions code in Access Tenant. Um, there's a few more files that tie all the disparate pieces together, being able to set your tenant through subdomain and domain, serializing sidekick jobs, things like that. But at its core, that's the main piece. Uh, and I'm glad I had the chance to dig into it and learn a bit how multi-tenancy works uh, and, and hopefully dispel some fears for some of the younger developers like myself. So thank you for taking the time to listen. I know many of you probably already know this. Uh, but I'm glad I had the chance to share. So thank you so much. Um, hey, hey, everyone. Um, I'm Mike Ederwar. I'm a software engineer at uh, Fountain. Shout out to Fountain. All the Fountaineers here. Um, just wanted to kind of give my 
positive experience with, I guess, mentorship, I guess, coming from uh, the mentors side of the wheelhouse. Um, I'm an engineer. I've been, I guess, coding in different companies for about 10 years. Um, I joined Fountain this year in July, um, and this is actually the first time I've worked at a rail shop. Um, and so, you know, using Ruby, I guess, day to day. Um, I've used Ruby in the past before, but not like uh, as intensive as this. Um, and so, one of the things I talked to my manager about when I first started was, you know, I, uh, I have done a lot of like mentorship in different companies, I've uh, led junior engineers, I've sort of like did my best to sort of like establish paths and practices that junior devs can take to kind of grow in their careers. And he mentioned that like, yeah, you know, um, it could be a good opportunity for you to sort of like, you know, mentor one of the folks here at Fountain and also sort of like, you know, seek some, some benefits of like, you know, learning Fountain system, learning Ruby, and also learning some of the um, things that we do on, on the rail side. And I, I, uh, I feel like that, that was kind of the best suggestion that I've had, I guess, in the last six months. Um, my mentee's actually already here. What's up, Michael? Um, but like, he's been a big help for me to sort of like understand, you know, the whys, why we do things at Fountain. Um, and so like, you know, investigating why we use VCR to sort of like, you know, uh, do contract uh, testing or like why we use the, this fancy or swag sort of like module to sort of like build uh, Swagger um, um, API documentation. So it's been really helpful and I feel like it's really been reciprocal in, in ways where like, I can sort of like show him sort of the stuff I've done in previous companies, how I sort of like think about pair programming and TDD. Or, and then he's also been helping me as well. So um, mentorship isn't just about like, you know, pulling, you know, making sure mentees improve. You can also, as a mentor, sort of improve yourself as well. So um, yeah, just wanted to shout that out. Um, I think um, all that to say that like, uh, Fountain is also now sort of like drumming up its own like formal mentorship program, just based on the stuff that me and Michael have gone through for the past, I guess, six months. And so like, um, yeah, if you wanna learn more about, I guess what we're doing over there and um, or pick my brain a little bit about it, um, I'll be here today and tomorrow, so. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Should I start when it starts to count down? So I have exactly five. Oh, there it goes. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I guess this is my lightning talk. It was going to be called something like, why, open, like, why contributing to open source is easy? Um, and I picked that name because I was like, oh, this is like something that's like, you can immediately refute. You're like, how can he stand up there and just like say, oh, you know, open source, it's so easy. Like, it's not easy. We all know that. Like, it's, it's sometimes, it sometimes feels challenging to like get in and make contributions and things like that. Um, so I, I think this talk is geared to people who like never made an open source contribution at all, um, which was me probably um, prior, like a couple months or so ago, maybe a year, I forget. Um, but the thing, like for me, when I made my like first open source contribution, like the barrier in for int of the barrier for me was just like there were so many just libraries and things out there, and there were so many people doing incredible things in like the Ruby world, the JavaScript world, like all the different worlds where I felt like, how can I just come in and you know make some contribution that's like meaningful? And it turns out contributing to open source is actually really easy because like one of the things, like one of the most recent um, PRs I did was actually on uh, Hanabi. And it was like super, 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 super small. Like if you look at the last like 10, 20 commits, you'll see me and you'll be like, this is very, very small commit. And, and kind of the strategy I used was I wasn't actually trying to um, find a way to like contribute in a really, really small way. Um, what I was trying to do was, um, everybody was posting about how interesting Hanabi was. Like, this is like a completely different new framework. Um, and people were doing things with it. And people were saying, oh, it's ready. And you could do all these great things with it. And I was like, OK, cool. I want to see. So I think the strategy is like curiosity. First, you have to be like, hey, there's something I'm interested in. And I'm interested enough to like dig in and kind of poke around and see a little bit more. The next thing I did was like, okay, I've never played with this tool set before, and like every tool set, I just say, where's the help guide? Where's the getting started? And I was like, okay, here it is. Here's a bunch of examples that uh, the, the maintainers wrote. And I was like, cool. So I went to my terminal, I opened it up, and I copy-pasted the first line and read a bunch of stuff. Copy-pasted the second line, read a bunch of stuff. Speeding things up because I have two minutes and 24 seconds, and then uh, <laughs> my talk, but I eventually got to a point where I was like, okay, I'm following the guide, I'm making it work, and then I did something interesting where I copied and pasted some code, 
and I looked at the output, and I looked at um, what the output was in the getting started guide, and I was like, these don't really match. And that's when I figured out open source is really, really easy. Like, because at that point, I was like, okay, cool. So if this doesn't match, someone else is going to be very confused, and I should probably like edit this file and like push it up to GitHub and just like do a pull request. Now that part could be a little bit confusing <laughs> if you haven't done that, but there's like guides that kind of explain like, hey, this is how you do a PR and all this stuff. So I went through this whole process, and the whole time I was like, well, you know, my it, it took me a lot longer than just like changing a couple of characters and fixing it. And I was like, well, is this worth it? And you know, I was with my father, and he's like, we gotta go. And I was like, one more minute, like I gotta do this and like do this pull request and like come back later and hopefully it gets merged. And I was able to do it and went away, I think it was like the day after Thanksgiving because I was like bored and need some stuff to do and I came back home and there it was. The last commit was into the library, it was, it was the documentation guides, it was just me and I changed a couple words and, and it was there and it felt so good to just be like, hey, I, I left things a little bit better than I found it. And you know what the best part was? And maybe this is why I like the Ruby community uh, particularly, but maybe this would have happened if it was a JavaScript library too, a Python. But I like to think it was because I was in a Ruby um, community. Was the, one of the principal developers on that project like saw that PR come in, and not only did he merge it, but he um, wrote a really nice note about like just, hey, hey thank you for playing with the tool set and thank you for just adding a little bit here and leaving the documentation a little bit better than you found it. And to me that was meaningful because I felt at that moment like I was part of something bigger, that I was part of a community that really cares and wants to make the open source projects and the work that we do here better, better for everyone. So that's my talk, thank you. Hey, my name's Jenner. Uh, I was going to talk to you about something we've been working on recently. Um, I've been doing some work for this company called uh, Flux, Flux.ai, and they're building a web-based uh, schematic capture and PCB design tool that runs in your browser. It's, it's kind of nuts. If you asked me a year ago that if, if they could do it, I'd say they're crazy, but they're doing it. Um, so what I'm looking into them is integrating this 30-year-old circuit simulation library called ng-spice to compile to WebAssembly and run in the browser. Um, so basically, how that works is you have a schematic that you need to translate into a netlist format for ng-spice. Um, you can see here, there's a, I labeled the nets that things are connected to, and on the right, there's the components um, and what they're connected to, and a bunch of other crazy stuff that I won't get into. Uh, so when you run it, um, what we're interested in doing is a transient analysis where you simulate the circuit over a certain amount of time and a certain number of time steps, and you can get a sense of how it behaves in the time domain. Um, so in this case here, we ran it for two and a half seconds and see a estimate of the voltages that it gets after it does a bunch of, solves a bunch of differential equations and does some linear algebra. And you can see the plot there. There's that around uh, t equals one is where the uh, MOSFET turns on and then turns off and the capacitor recharges. It's not really related, but it's kind of cool. So what we were interested in figuring out is how its uh, memory usage behaves when given longer and longer simulation time periods and how it behaves with different circuits that have a lot of components or not very many components. And uh, this was a domain I really knew nothing about. Um, I'm, my, training, or my experience is mostly as full stack uh, web development. So I dove head first into this and uh, Ruby kind of helped me figure out how to deal with a bunch of things that I didn't really fully understand yet. So in the ng-spice uh, repository, they have a bunch of example circuits. So I had the idea to just plug those into a script and measure its memory usage and then see, see what we get. So first, first step for that was actually just to know like what is the peak memory usage of a thing. Um, after looking into a lot of different options for that, like somebody mentioned like, yeah, you should have used Valgrind. Did not want to do that. But I found out that the GNU version of time has a TACV argument. It gives you a bunch of useful like resource usage kind of stuff. And the uh, max resident set size is kind of the thing that we're most interested in. It's not like 
uh, really accurate, but it's, it, it gives you a good sense. So uh, I wrote a script that would take different circuits to test and different parameters for like how long to run the simulation and then parse out from the G time output. And uh, then I plugged it into GNU plot with this really ugly configuration to produce graphs like this, which uh, kind of confirmed our hypothesis that it should scale linearly with the duration of the simulation. Um, another thing that I found was kind of cool, I was like trying to make the script a little bit nicer to use. Um, so using option parser, uh, I wanted to be able to take in arguments with units. So instead of always having to specify nanoseconds for time, uh, I want to be able to say like ms or us for milliseconds and microseconds on the command line. So I added some methods to the numeric class and then discovered this uh, option parser accept method that lets you define kind of a custom type for it. Um, so basically I just parsed out uh, if it had a unit in it and then sent that to the, <laughs> to the number itself to convert it to the correct number of nanoseconds. Um, so that's kind of how it looks in practice. You just, with your ops on, you can specify a different type. Uh, anyway, um, this is really fast, but basically I just, uh, I really love Ruby. Um, it was like my lifeline in this thing that I was having some major imposter syndrome around in my first couple days. Um, it let me make sense of something that I'm still like trying to wrap my head around. So anyway, uh, I love Ruby. <laughs> Thank you. Alrighty. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming to the Lightning Talks. My talk is called Don't Abuse Reduce, and it is my love letter to our lovely innumerable module. So first about myself, I'm Alexander Momchilov. Uh, I work for Shopify. More specifically, I work on our, my clicker's not working. Okay, cool. Uh, error keys it is. Uh, I work on the Shop app, which is Shopify's mobile shopping app. It's pretty great, you should check it out. And so, I'm gonna talk about uh, the thesis, because my English prof always said you should leave that early on in your five paragraph essay, in the first paragraph preferably. Uh, and so the thesis is that when you have a code construct that's really powerful that can express a bunch of different ideas, that's powerful, but the flip side of that is that you can't, you lose readability, you can't understand it at a glance. It could be doing so many things, so what it's doing specifically is not so obvious. And when it comes for loops, we kind of get it. Here's an example of some imperative code on the left, an equivalent more functional style on the right. And so we have some grade cohorts. Let's say it's an array of arrays of students. And let's say you have one cohort for grade nine and 10 and so on. And you want to see, you know, who's in the honor roll of the school for the whole school. And so you iterate over your cohorts and you iterate over each student of each cohort. You check if they're on the honor roll and you bang them into that honor roll students array. We can see that there's a lot of indentation. There's nesting. It's not clear at a glance what exactly is going on. And the only way to really understand it is to kind of play Ruby interpreter in your head and kind of follow it along. With the call on the right, however, we're using some more well-defined constructs which are less expressive. They could do less, you know, filter map and, and filter map and friends. But when you see something like filter, there's a bunch of invariants you pick up right away. There's no new objects in the result that weren't in your input. The count of the output is at most the input or less, maybe even empty. Similarly for map, when you map some objects from your input to your output, you know there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. Nothing is gonna disappear, nothing extra will be added in. And so let's take an example. We have a sample problem here, we have some names, and we wanna kind of alpha, like, put them together by their first name into groups. And so we wanna come up with this like names by initial variable, and we want it to look something like this, you know, Joe and Jane are under J, and Bob and Betty are under B, and so on. And so even though in, when we write for loops, we kinda get the sense that, you know, map and filter is nice, we often run into using reduce, and we might write something like this. So I'll just kind of explain it really briefly. We start reducing over this empty hash, and the idea is that it's gonna become the accumulator to our first block call, and we're gonna see what the initial of the name is, we're gonna see if we already have a group for that initial, so you know, is there a J group already? And if there's already a group of Js, we'll add the new name under those Js, and if not, we'll start a new group with this like one element array, it'll be like the, the first group for that first letter. And it works, you just have to make sure you remember the accumulator at the end because you might not have type checking. If you forget to do that, you get some fun, uh, kind of hard to debug errors. But we might notice that we can remove that return at the end if we go to each with object instead, where we can mutate this object in place and we don't have to remember to return it from one block call to the next. But remember, each with object is kind of really just each with an object, and you could just use a local variable to do that. And look, with those two simple transformations, we went from reduce, you know, this like magical buzzwordy functional programming style uh, to just a for loop. 
and I heard that more functional is more better, uh, and this is not quite achieving that. So in this example, there's a really nice enumerable method, group by, which comes to the rescue. And it's actually much less powerful than reduce. It can strictly do fewer kinds of solutions to problems. But it's really clear here. We're grouping the input, and we're passing a block of how to group things, and so in this case, it's by the first character of each string. And in doing so, we, when we see group by, we can automatically understand something about the result. It's going to be a hash. The keys are always gonna be the output of this block. The values of the hash are always gonna be like these array groupings whose elements are the grouped up uh, members of the initial input. So we go back to reduce, it's like, okay, well, what does this kind of do exactly? You gotta really play interpreter, you gotta like really squint at it, go in there. And I have two takeaways for you here. One is that the neural module is fantastic. It has a whole bunch of built-in methods that probably do what you're looking for. The second is that reduce is actually expressive enough to implement almost every method in the enumerable module. And so I'll give an example here. Uh, include. So we'll say, you know, start with false. We, oh, sorry, uh, yeah, it, 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 like check for inclusion. We'll start with false. We haven't seen the item yet. And on every iteration, we'll see, have we seen the item already? If not, check if the current item is the needle in our haystack. Maybe this doesn't bail early the way you might want to, so that if you find, you know, your needle on the first element, you don't have to go through the whole input. But this is just an example of how you can implement these other methods using uh, uh, reduce. And here's another example. You could do uh, none or any or all. In fact, uh, you don't even need the result to be a simple scalar object like a, a Boolean. You can have something like 2a or 2 hash uh, or 2h, where you start with this empty array or you start with this empty hash and you build it up. And so, in fact, even though it's called reduce, your final value is more complex than what you started with and you've built it up one iteration at a time. And so in conclusion, I think the room module is something you should kind of look at whenever you're about to write some code so that when somebody comes to your code, they don't have to play interpreter. They see filter map, they see map, they can understand it quicker at a glance without needing to dive into the nitty gritty details. And that was my first talk and I got this red badge that says speaker on it by accident and I'm gonna wear that now. <laughs> All right. So for the makers of Stack Overflow, um, we came, uh, it came up with some uh, marketing buzzwords like artificial intelligence and uh, biz ops, and we've decided that we're gonna make a new product, and this one is uh, Stack Overflow Embedded. Uh, our algorithms have detected that on Stack Overflow, 95% of all new questions are stupid, um, according to our algorithm. And so, you know, we're trying to curb this problem um, and come up with something that's gonna like prevent these stupid questions from making it onto Stack Overflow. So um, we came up with this, this simple procedure that you go to your doctor and you have these chips installed in your brain and um, it allows you to like hear a moderator's voice in your head whenever like you have a stupid question. And so uh, this part is uh, your guys' responsibility. You're, you're playing the role of the Stack Overflow moderators that are in my head as I ask these questions. The, the first one we'll do together. So can I embed this PHP script in my Rails app? You know, that would, you, stupid, you're an idiot. Rewrite it in Rust, something like that. <laughs> this job posting is for Go. Can I convince them to use Ruby? It's off topic, by the way. <laughs> Should I run Rails ENV production rake DB drop to fix this failing migration? Why is the color Chuck Norris red? <laughs> Sorry, that was actually um, a duplicate. That one's been asked on Stack Overflow. <laughs> can we transpile React into Ruby so we can put it on the front end? And how do I make the voices stop? <laughs> uh, you know, um, I did have to put this warning slide on there. Um, may cause hallucinations, hunger, unexplainable odors, fatigue, depression, loss of coordinated muscle function, inability to distinguish reality from fiction. Some applicants of the trial program have not been found. Uh, also made from materials known to the state of California to cause cancer. So, thank you. All right. Hi, I'm Casey. Casey. I want to tell you about an injury I had because I work in tech. Are you a tech worker? Did you know there are job hazards to this? Like coding for 30 years might not be healthy. 
I was incapacitated for months two years ago. Months. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't drive my car. I couldn't sit at the computer, which hurt me in the first place. I couldn't even sit up and watch TV on the couch or on a chair or anything. So I imagine me laying on the floor of my apartment watching Mary Poppins on the ceiling with a projector a friend brought over. That was very thoughtful of them to do that for me, so I had something to do. It was a miserable time. You don't want to go through it. But what, what is it? What's going on? I have what doctors call peripheral neuropathy. Peripheral means far away, and neuropathy means uh, nerve pain, neuropathy. I call it the tingly fingles. My hands, they, they tingled. Um, this happens because when you have neck or shoulder tension and it can like affect the nerve, that affects the muscle to make the muscle tense and da 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 da, -da all the way down. And, it, and then it really manifests in your fingers, your extremities first. Um, I want you all to do a self-check. Please stand up if you are down to do this. Um, stick out your arm. Put your other hand on your shoulder keep, to keep that down. When I'm going to, I'll, I'll demonstrate. I'm going to have you do this, which is hard. A lot of you can't do it. Keep your shoulder down. If it goes up, you're cheating. Don't let it cheat. Some people get stuck here, and then you feel it right here in this nerve, and you're like, I can't go any further. Sometimes you can get all the way up to 90 degrees. Sometimes you can go all the way to the 45 degree angle. Sometimes you can get all the way and touch your side of your head. Maybe you're lucky you can hit the palm of your hand to your head. All right, now uh, you can sit down. That was the test. Try it on the other side later. If you felt any tension or it was uncomfortable in some way, raise your hand. Yeah, a lot of people. Ideally, if you were perfectly healthy, you would be able to go all the way. Most people can. I'm not surprised a lot of us can't quite. Here's another test. Imagine right now your head went limp. Does it fall forward or backwards? Forward. A lot of people are going to fall forward because we're used to looking down at our laps, at our phones. Ideally, it wouldn't fall either way. It's kind of balanced. That would be even better if you could get to that point in your life. Um, we just did a nerve glide uh, stretch or a test. That's the one I just had you do. Uh, another good self-diagnosis is someone to take, get someone you live with or a friend or a coworker to take a photo of you when you're not ready for it. Give them permission. And then you can see yourself in all of your glory. <laughs> You'll know what you really look like. All right, time for an anatomy lesson. Uh, the pinky side of your hand is one nerve. The thumb side is another nerve. Carpal tunnel and cubital tunnel are two different uh, issues. Cubital tunnel is pretty common in tech workers. You might have never heard of it. Uh, look it up later. Uh, imagine you're programming like this. That, that's going to hurt the thumb side of your hand, that nerve. Or if you're on the phone or sleeping on your arm, that hurts the pinky side of your, your arm, it's the elbow. How do you heal or prevent this? Well, if, well, we think about what irritates it. We'll do less of that. That helps a lot. Um, if you are really injured, you'll get recommended to do an elbow brace or wrist brace. So then the nerve is in the right position that it can heal. That's nice. If your desk setup could be more ergonomic, that'll help prevent the bad posture that hurts you. Um, at home, you want to have your chair adjustable, your desk adjustable, your monitor adjustable. All three, all three ideally. How many do you have adjustable right now? Raise your hand. One, two, three. Three, three, three. A lot of threes. Good. If you're just one or two, you want to up it. If you're out co-working at a coffee shop, you might want to have a monitor stand um, to bring the screen up. Um, to really heal, the thing that the physical therapists always tell everyone to do is you have to stretch and strengthen. So you stretch your front, like sometimes I stand on a door frame and then my chest, I stretch these muscles out. Sometimes I strengthen my back by making those back muscles engage to do this kind of thing. Lots of videos on YouTube for exercises you could do. Another thing is to get rid of knots. You can do like massage or needling, um, e-stimulation. They do a lot of those. I do a lot of massage, water massage. I went to Spa World on Monday. I got here early. And that's how I look energetic. I'm not always this way. Nerve flossing is another thing uh, you can do regularly, like that one that I just had you do. Or just general exercise helps a lot. No surprise. All right, how about healthcare? Can you get any healthcare for this? If you're just trying to prevent yourself from having numb and tingly fingers, my experience in the healthcare systems is no. Nope. You can't just do preventative care in the US. That's not really the thing. But if you get injured, if your fingers start tingling, that's your ticket. Now you can go see a physical therapist as soon as it gets that bad. And then as soon as they stop tingling, I stop tingling, thankfully, but that don't really help anymore. I got to do it on my own. So if your fingers start to have the tingles, tingly fingles, then that's your ticket to healthcare. And I want you all to prioritize your health. I'm Casey. Good luck with your health.
Hi, everyone. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was coding in my home office, and um, it was afternoon, and there was daylight, and I didn't have any lights on. And I was really engrossed in my programming. It was Ruby, of course. And um, suddenly, I realized the room was dark. The sun had already almost completely set. And a few minutes later, it got completely dark, and all I could see was a screen. So I decided to write a song about it. And, um, this is to the tune of Under the Boardwalk. If you choose to do the Under the Boardwalk parts, feel free, except that it's coding with Ruby instead of Under the Boardwalk. So uh, here we go. Uh, let's start this up. <clears throat> Oh, when the sun goes down, my screen's the only thing I see. This troubled world recedes, leaving just my code and me. Just me and Ruby. Keyboard and screen, oh yeah. Problem solving and building makes me serene. Ready? Coding with Ruby. Ruby's lean, clean, and mean. Coding with Ruby. Best language I've ever seen. Coding with Ruby. The language I love. Coding with Ruby. Seems like it came from above. Coding with Ruby. Ruby. When OO's not enough, and I need me some FP. I pull some lambdas out and solve the problem one, two, three. Just me and Ruby, keyboard and screen, oh yeah. Problem solving and building, they make me serene. Coding with Ruby, Ruby's lean, clean and mean. Coding with Ruby. Best language I've ever seen, coding with Ruby. The language I love, coding with Ruby. Seems like it came from above, coding with Ruby. Ruby. Just me and Ruby, keyboard and screen, oh yeah. Problem solving and building, they make me serene. Coding with Ruby, Ruby's lean, clean and mean. Coding with Ruby, best language I've ever seen. Coding with Ruby, the language I love. Coding with Ruby. Seems like it came from above. Coding with Ruby. Ruby. Thank you. Uh, so uh, I was working on my first conference talk in 2014 for RubyConf here. And uh, I saw this tweet. Um, and uh, I had met Angela Harms at a prior conference, uh, Ruby Midwest 2011. And I grew up a few miles from Ferguson, Missouri, so this was literally hitting close to home. Uh, there was protests and violence. Uh, I was glued to the TV, uh, the news. I was also reading and watching TV at the same time, and, and I was just, I didn't know what to do. I was sad, I was mad. Uh, that first week I cried a couple times, um, you know, I'm just seeing all this on TV and trying to figure things out, and, and I didn't know what to do. Um, I went to some protests, some marches, um, and, you know, that was, that, was, that was fine, but it didn't feel like I was making much of an impact. It didn't feel like I was using my talents. Um, so I gave my talk at RubyConf, it went really well. Uh, the next week I came back and I read this, this uh, a uh, post from Alex Miller, who does the um, Strange Loop Conference in St. Louis. And I had met him at meetups. And 
I was like, oh, this is exactly what I'm looking for. It uses my talents. Uh, the, the idea was to help underprivileged kids learn how to make websites uh, so they could help their community. So I'm like, this is great. So uh, the program ran eight weeks uh, per session. Uh, the kids were from, I believe, 13 to 27. Uh, this is Cameron. Uh, he was one of the students in the first cohort. cohort and uh, we were, I was mentoring him one-on-one, -on -one, and we were teaching them WordPress, and specifically we were showing them plugins, and we showed them a, a plugin to do sports scores, and he asked me, how do I show just my team? And I told him, I don't know, let's find out. Uh, so we searched Google. I told them, okay, we're using WordPress, and this is the name of the plugin, and, and we want one team. So just type those words into Google. And I, he, I, he types the words into Google, he clicks on the link, and I'm like, I think you just copy that and put your team name in there. So he copies that, puts his team name in there, and it works. And at that moment, I saw the light bulb go off in his head. Uh, because I had said those words, you know. These are the most powerful words I've ever said to anyone. Uh, it had the biggest impact, at least to me, maybe not him, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but it let him know that he could figure things out on his own. It gave him confidence. It, it let him know that this is something we can all learn about and figure out. Um, so the first time I gave this talk, it was a 40-minute talk. Uh, the link's actually up there if you want to see the slides for that. Um, and when I was making that, I thought, well, that's interesting. Uh, I was talking about the community of helping the community there with that, that tech impact and helping him learn how to make websites, but there was also this story of the, the, the tech community. Uh, Alex Harms had, had uh, posted the thing where I first learned about the, the Ferguson. Uh, Alex had uh, posted the thing about this, this program. And I was working with RubyConf and Actually, RubyConf 2017, there was another talk that, that, that brought this all together. Um, and we have, this is a great community. The Ruby community is a great community. Uh, we help each other, we learn from each other, but we have other communities. You know, we have our local communities, we have cities, states, neighborhoods, country, the planet. Um, you know, and, and giving to those communities is uh, a type of thing that actually you give to the community, but you get so much more back. And that's the lesson I took away is community can help you find purpose. And, and when you give, you get so much more than, than you gave. And, and it's just a way to give back to this community that, that has helped me. So I, I urge you to find a way, find your community, find a way to help those communities. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Let me just adjust that a little higher here. Uh, I'm James. Uh, I work with Shopify. Uh, you can find me on GitHub and Twitter at Sunblaze. We're going to do some live coding here. I had just to break you away from some of those slides. It might get a little boring. So let's go get back into Ruby, which is the one thing I love. The first thing I'm going to say is I love the Pooter book. I've read it three times at least. Sandy Metz made one of the best books ever. Um, I'm going to steal some of her examples here, so hopefully she doesn't mind fair use and all that. Um, and uh, let's do a little live test-driven development and, uh, and, and show kind of like how we could fail fast with Sorbet. And it starts now. All right, so uh, one of the books here, or one of the classes here, oh crap, we're already having issues here. Live, we're live here. Um, so yeah, let's go see if um, any of these tabs will actually load. Let's go run while I'm running here, see. No, 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 none of this is working. All right, um, I'll give it a second, but otherwise I do have a recording of this. I made a backup plan, just, just in case. Don't worry, people. Even though I love doing it live, well, I'll fake it. Just, but yeah, that sucks, but okay. All right, so uh, let's go jump ahead here a little bit. So we'll start with the code. Okay. I'll pause it if I need to here. Okay, so we got a couple classes here. There's the wheel class, and the wheel has its own test. Perfect unit test. It tests only the wheel class. Now we have also the gear. The gear is dependent on the wheel. Right, now so we're gonna test the gear, but we don't wanna test the wheel. We already have a test for the wheel. So um, when we run this test, 
it's gonna be testing two classes. It's gonna test the gear class and the wheel test class. Now, in this example, it's not a big deal. Like, there's no remote calls, but when you're dealing with real code, it's usually making a database call, it's making remote calls. It doesn't really matter, but we wanna make it fast, keep it fast, so we wanna keep it isolated. So let's go see what the isolated version looks like. It's pretty simple, so I'll bring it up here. The, the isolated version, we mock out the wheel. So the wheel class, we make it return a stub that returns the diameter at a fixed amount. We change the test a bit to match that. And you can I'll just wait for the video to catch up here. <laughs> uh, we're gonna run the rake test kind of thing, make sure that it all passes. Now, the one downside to this, now that we've isolated and put in a mock, if we change the wheel class, what happens? What happens to the, the gear class? So we'll see, we'll see what happens here as we run the tests and we'll wait for it. How much time do we have? Two minutes, we're good. So it still passes, that's not good. Like we need it to fail, like gear is using the wheel, but since we isolated it, it's not really great in that way. So Sandy gives a great example, I'll pause it right now. Sandy in her book gives a great example on how to test this. Um, it's, it's one roundabout way to do it, but um, I, I like using Sorbet, uh, at Shopify, we started using Sorbet quite a lot. And so even with Sorbet, I don't even add any typing here, um, but we add it in, and you'll see kind of some of the magic that Sorbet brings. Move that out of the way. Wait for it. All right, so Sorbet shows that it's broken. So they do some checking, obviously, on uh, static code analysis to find that you have a dependency on the, the wheel class, but the, the, the method name has changed, and that no longer works. So we go and fix that, we run the tests again, because we're doing test-driven development here, and we want to get it all green. We see, okay, no, we still have to update our mock now too, which is great, okay, so we go in here, fix our mock here to match now the real implementation, and we run it again, running Sorbet first, and run, then running our tests, and it's all good. And that's it, my folks. Thank you very much. I'm James, once again, Reed Smith. Uh, I work at Shopify. I love Ruby, and I love Sandy Metz's book. It's one of the best things. And keep your tests fast and isolated. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name's Adam Hampton. I'm an engineering manager at SecZeta. We are a small uh, identity management startup company based in New England. And we are a Ruby on Rails shop. Um, I've had the pleasure of being with the company for about 10 months now, and this is my first Ruby shop. Um, a decade, two decade career of software engineering, uh, this is my first time to actually do Ruby professionally instead of kind of playing with it in home projects. And it's been a lot of fun. Uh, we are you know, a monolith, an on-prem monolith that has evolved to a multi-tenant SaaS cloud offering. And there's a lot of steps that go into migrating a piece of software that you're used to giving one copy to one customer with their one database in-house, where they bring the infrastructure, to porting it to being multi-tenant, to putting it on your own cloud provider, we happen to use Amazon, uh, and getting it up and running in those, in those arenas. And uh, one of the things we've come across is we need to grow past a monolith. So we need to distribute parts of our application into other Ruby services that are not our main you know, Rails app. And as we do that, different forms of inter-process communication uh, are necessary. Uh, in one part of our platform, we want to stop storing logs and user X changed Y at time Z records in a relational database and move that off to a more durable uh, storage system that handles uh, immutable records really well. And we're realizing a bunch of our services need to emit these messages and one service needs to consume them and persist them. And uh, in my past, I've worked in other SaaS companies that use messaging systems for this, um, asynchronous messaging. So this is a very rough, not official definition. Uh, Inter-process communication, um, we have some message passing infrastructure. Usually it's non-blocking to the producer, um, sometimes uh, leveraging non-rest full HTTP transport um, for providing communication between services. So it allows 
platforms or two services to have a fire and forget kind of communication between your services. I've got this message, I want it to go to that service over there, there it goes, I don't care when they get that, they can consume it on their own time. If they need to message me back, that can either come back through the same channel or through a different channel, but some kind of infrastructure like that. So being new to Ruby and you know, looking at the Rails packages, looking at the Ruby packages, I was looking for something that provided these kind of messaging paradigms. Service A emits individual messages in a sequence, preferably FIFO, over to service B. So the icon on the top left showing multiple instances of service A might emit messages over some topic, and then they are consumed or processed by multiple instances of service B, uh, and maybe it interacts with its own database. That is very close to the Apache Kafka paradigm, uh, to, to how Kafka works uh, in terms of message passing. You have producers, you have consumers, things get sent over the wire. Uh, we also need something like service X in the bottom left emits a, everybody needs to know that something has changed. And all instances of service Y, or maybe not shown in the diagram, service Z need to hear that and do their own thing. Um, a great way to think about that is cache busting. Uh, you know, somebody's changed a record that you might have cached, everybody that might have a cached copy of it, invalidate your local cache copies. And so we call this topic-based communication and kind of broadcast-based communication. And we're lucky, we've been successful, we have eight different production copies of our software, and each one of those has some number of tenants on it. We have, uh, you know, five in North America, sorry, this slide got a little garbled when we were uh, messing with the side, so let me take this back a little bit. Um, we have five in North America, you know, and three in Europe, and you know, one of the five in North America is in Canada, and those roughly map to the regulatory environments that our customers need to keep their data in. European you know, GPDR requirements and human resources data requirements are different than North America, so we have to house that data in European servers, things like that. Um, but that brings us a problem, which is every time we invite a piece of infrastructure into our platform, we don't pay for it once. We don't even pay for it three times if you need three servers to run a messaging system. We pay for it eight times whatever it takes to bring in that piece of infrastructure. And so, you know, looking at messaging systems, there are a bunch of infrastructure-based systems. You could use RabbitMQ, you could use Apache Kafka, you could use uh, Apache QMP, and each one of those has some kind of infrastructure burden that brings a cost. And we were looking for what is the most cost-effective way to do this that brings us the non-blocking, the durability, the asynchronicity of it. And my question to the audience, since I'm running out of time here, is what solutions did you come up with? We already had Redis for session caching. I couldn't find a gym that did durable message passing over Redis. We built our own. Have you found one out there? If so, please come talk to me after the talks. I'd love to hear about it. And is there interest in us open sourcing the one we have? Because you know, message passing isn't exactly our you know, core business. So thanks, and uh, hopefully I'll talk to you after the talk. Yeah. So. I'm Jesse Flores, I work for Fountain uh, with Andrew and Michael here. And um, this talk is really two stories, how I sometimes refer too much to the internet. <laughs> um, so these are actual Google searches that I've done in the past few weeks or months. I just got this new computer, but this is part of my history. So I have a dog, and it turns out you have to feed a dog differently based on the, their age. Like when they're born, you have to feed them three times a day. So I defer that to Google, and I'll get in a second to as, as to why this is relevant, like why Googling all this stuff is relevant. Uh, best tacos in Austin, I'm, I live in Austin, I was just looking for the best tacos. So I kind of like decide a lot, many things <laughs> through Google, uh, and that's very good in some instances, not very good in, in others. Um, the classic example, an error uh, just popped up on my terminal, <laughs> I copy pasted it on Google, and solved it uh, not very long after. Uh, so it was very helpful. So what I'm concerned about is us, or me, I try to remind myself and think uh, every now and then about how it is important to uh, step back and kind of use the most important resource I have for my brain <laughs> uh, to really think through the problems and not just go on automatic of like what, what tacos are the best in Austin and just like go to number one, which I sometimes done uh, for other things. I don't know if I don't think I did it for tacos, but for other things I've done that. Uh, sometimes it's good, but sometimes I have different preferences. It's not all about like the ranking. It's also, also what you prefer, what I, if I, uh, like I have a dog if I want to bring it or things like that that are more nuanced. That is not always 
about what's best in the internet. <laughs> um, and uh, the second part of it, the second story, is about a coworker. We're a coworker, Toby. Um, he was very, a very particular person. I, it, he's very unique, uh, I would describe it, because I think many people that interact with him, uh, some people really dislike him. Uh, I really like him. Uh, he's very direct, very honest, and he always kept me on my toes of having this kind of perspective of actually thinking through the code and thinking about what we're actually doing. Uh, one story about this, about Toby, uh, one December, uh, I didn't take vacation, like I had taken my honeymoon vacation that year, so I stayed to, to work uh, for a few days, 20-something uh, December, and we were coding on the iOS app, so if you don't work on iOS, every time you open a new file on Xcode, it creates these lines of comments at the top, and it's pretty much the author's name, the date, and other things that are really not that useful, and he immediately deleted them. I was like, what, wait, what, what's going on? I would, I think if he wasn't there, I would probably just keep, keep them and commit them and upload them and just do that over and over again and kind of like have that, those lines there. But he's a very conscious, methodical uh, person. And so I guess I learned a bunch from him or not just following all the best practices. I think it's a good start to just follow most of the best practices, but exceptions like this one where the comments at the top of these files were just noise and polluting the file. In his opinion, I kind of, well, yeah, sure, like, yeah, let's, let's remove them. Um, so you kind of, it's okay to go against the, the grain in some instances. For most cases, best practices are what's, what works, but just uh, some of my experience in, in kind of this, this weird topic of being conscious about your code and like just not following uh, what the internet says. Uh, thank you. I'll be talking to you today about uh, a new um, ritual that me and my team have been trying out at work um, for the past few months. Uh, we call it the weekly cool down, and it's a way to invoke fun at work. A little bit about me. Uh, my name is Anas Al-Khatib. I'm a senior developer at Shopify. I work on payment processing. Um, and here are a couple of ways you can contact me. Uh, so what is it? It is a weekly recurring session. It happens at the end of the week, um, near the end of the work week, um, where we get together and work on a simple technical problem together. Uh, it's completely optional, uh, but people are also encouraged, if they're not able to attend or they don't feel like attending that week, to practice it on, uh, by themselves. Um, why do we do it? Uh, it's a way to invoke fun at work. Uh, it's a way to collaborate, get to know each other's ways of working in a low stress, low stake, and tackle a low stake problem. Um, it gives us a chance to share tools and tips and tricks on how we work with our tools, um, our IDEs, we, we get to learn from each other. And it also uh, gives us a chance to end the week on a positive note. Sometimes uh, the work that we are doing during the week might be something very complex or something very hard. So it gives a little bit of a barrier between uh, your work week and your weekend, and you end it uh, with a clear mind without having to take that work with you to the weekend. Um, some of the example problems that we've tackled so far. Uh, simple things like going through to-dos and either uh, refactoring, uh, fixing them, or if they're no longer applicable, deleting them, or uh, just converting them into an issue and getting them out of the code base. Um, identifying high churn files and applying small refactors to them. So high churn files are files that have changed often or have been committed to often. Um, uh, there's a little script that if you search uh, for in that link uh, that tells you how to identify those high churn files in your uh, Git repository. Um, improve our documentation, so small improvements. Uh, quality of life improvements to tools um, that as a team we might deprioritize, okay, there's this bug in our own internal tool 
but we always have things that are higher priority that we keep uh, tackling. And this gives us a chance to fix those small things. Uh, and many of these ideas and other ideas can be found on this code quality challenge, which is a 30-day challenge um, started by uh, Ben Orenstein, um, which was very fun to follow, and we've been taking some examples from them. Uh, some of the challenges we faced trying to uh, practice these weekly cooldowns is we have different people in different time zones, so the end of the week is not necessarily the same for everybody. We, for us, we've just had it uh, scheduled when the majority of us uh, are at, at our end of the week. Um, one suggestion is for individuals to practice it uh, themselves, or uh, if we're able to, um, uh, maybe if, they, if there's many people in a different time zone, they can have their own session. Uh, figuring out the tools that we use for the collaboration, uh, especially when we have more than three people on the session, has been uh, difficult. For us, we've sort of gotten um, VS Code Live Share, plus somebody sharing the screen, plus getting together in a huddle as a way uh, to work through this uh, uh, weekly cooldown. Um, this was inspired by a, an article. Uh, written by David Hong, um, and there's a link to it there. And here's a quotation from the article I'll leave you with. Uh, the more you know someone as a human being, the better collaboration model you'll have when you're doing work. So this also benefits us in our day-to-day -day work as well. I uh, want to give a shout out to my team, the Shopify Payments Payment Processing uh, Squad for uh, giving this uh, exercise a chance, and I want to thank the RubyConf organizers and thank all of you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Amanda Lundberg, and I am your captioner for RubyConf this year. Yes. All right. That's the words up there. Um, through the magic of telepathy, I'm captioning right now. Just kidding. I have to stick to the script exactly because I recruited Andrew from the AV crew to help out. Thank you, Andrew, for hitting function F12 repeatedly for me. <laughs> Cheers. And please give the AV team a huge round of applause. They're doing a great job. So back to captioning business. What is captioning? It is a stenographer me, in this case, sitting in the back of the room with a wee little keyboard, we call it writing, um, and I'm writing every word uttered by the speakers. It's more like playing a piano than typing on a keyboard. I have put some examples on the screen, because when you think of the word fish, I always spell it T-P-E-U-R-B, obviously. T-P is an F, E-U is an I, and RB is a sh sound. Got it? Steno writers can also make short forms of words to make our lives easier. Talking about your infrastructure? No problem. That's T-P-R-A-S, of course. And there's the T-P equals F again, by the way. Make sense yet? We can also write entire phrases with one key press. At the same time is T-A-E-U-P-L-T. -E no problem. Uh, oh, I missed up. OK. To learn, learn a lot about Steno and other cool keyboards, I recommend following at Haunty on TikTok and Instagram. She covers a ton of stuff and also accepts challenges to write really fast songs. And she's just awesome. She's my coworker at White Coat Captioning. How lucky am I? Uh, so how do I write Ruby? R-A-O, an asterisk, and U-B. All they, see I had a misspell on my own script. All the keys <laughs> go down at the same time. If you know that A-O-U is a long U sound, this one actually really makes sense. This is awkward. I know you want to learn more, so follow Haunty and also check out Open Steno Project. There are developers who love Steno and are working to make it more accessible to more people. The biggest barriers to many people getting started are the startup costs. A professional machine 
can be $5,000 and the proprietary software is five to $7,000 with a yearly fee for maintenance. Ouch. But I've just learned that stenographers can take the certification tests with our national association using Plover, which is the free software, Open Steno Project, so that's cool. And I learned that from Haunty. I feel like she should be here. <laughs> and feel free to stop by and say hi. I love showing off the machines and I promise to not make your words appear up on the big screen unless you want them to. And again, my name is Amanda and I work for White Coat Captioning. Norma Miller is my boss and she's kind of an awesome boss, like the kind Susan talked about yesterday. Follow us on the socials or follow my doggos, Edie and Arthur on Instagram. They're pretty cute. I hope you have a wonderful RubyConf. Thank you.